just FYI, the, the paper has just been uh, accepted and published on Yaman Neurology, so it's also freely available for everyone to have a more detailed look at the work. Um, so the reason we looked into the plasma biomarkers is that, of course, there's a huge development in the fields of, of neurodegenerative diseases and particularly Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the biomarkers are getting really quite good. Um, and we can go beyond the standard yes, no, is there amyloid in this case pathology? Yes or no? Can we go a step beyond that? Um, cause that first, uh, classification has now been shown that it's very, like, uh, it's very doable with a high certainty to classify someone being amyloid or, uh, tau positive or negative. Actually, more amyloid to be very honest. Um, so we want to go a step beyond because there is uh, quite a scale of different blood biomarkers that we can now measure, uh, in terms of uh, different processes of the brain. But within uh, the, the PTAL world, if, if, if you might want to say, there are also different ver forms that we can look at, and particularly PTAL217 uh, is considered to be the optimal biomarker, bit, depending on the essay, but it, it's suggested to be really quite good. Um, and there's been this novel approach recently uh, suggested to actually not uh, use one cutoff to identify those that are amyloid positive or negative, but actually implements multiple cutoffs to have high certainty of positivity high certainty of negativity and those that are basically in that uh, gray zone band where you probably need to do some confirmatory testing. And we basically wanted to investigate if um, that approach could be used in a clinical setting, also considering the developments in trials that are going on and design specifically of the Donanumab trial, where it was required for people to be uh, amyloid positive uh, and then subsequently have a certain range of tau burden. So we really went beyond just the yes, no, and amyloid. We went to high certainty of amyloid, high certainty of no amyloid, and just to confirmatory testing those in the middle, and then subsequently identifying for those who have high tau burden, where it might be debated whether those people should actually go on uh, disease modifying treatment or not, because it has been shown also at the CETA conference that the benefit, the clinical benefit of uh, these patients might be uh, limited. So we uh, included for uh, two cohorts from the Biofinder group here in uh, Lund, Sweden. Uh, the primary cohort was Biofinder 2, which encompasses basically the whole clinical continuum from normal to demented. And we included everyone that had available uh, plasma biomarkers. We include several plasma biomarkers. So PTO217, I already mentioned, but also things like NFL and GFAP. Um, and we basically looked into what is the optimal combination or single biomarker that we can use to predict those that are amyloid positive with high certainty, which is a requirement for any anti-amyloid trial we currently have. Uh, and we actually saw by using simple logistic regressions, but also uh, machine learning methods, a bit more fancy, if you will. Uh, and actually, this, the, the PTAU217 by itself did the best job. And considering one biker marker is always the simplest, why not move forward with that one? Um, so with very high certainty, we could identify those that are amyloid positive. And then within that group, subsequently could identify with quite well certainty uh, as well that have high tau burden. So by doing this sort of two-step approach, the amount of confirmatory tests, in our case, PET scans, um, was reduced with about 70%. And I think that's extremely clinically relevant, not only for our patients that you know, will not need to undergo either invasive lumbar puncture for fluid biomarkers or radioactive uh, injection regarding PET, um, but also for our uh, institutions, because if these drugs become available in the States or in Europe, and we are going to have to routinely do more of these uh, biomarker testing or MR scans, we don't have the facilities to, you know, to keep up with demand if we need to do that in everyone. So I think in that sense, plasma biomarkers is really key to streamline this process and make it actually clinically feasible and as least burdensome for patients and institutions to actually implement these drugs when they become, you know, when they get approved, if they get approved, but hopefully they will get approved. Um, so we showed that at the Biofinder 2 study that this is uh, do doable with a high uh, rate and actually it could reduce the costs uh, quite significantly. And we also importantly validated in the Biofinder 1 cohort, which is more of a clinical cohort, it's a bit smaller, slightly different essay, slightly different uh, tracer for TauPet, for example, but the results are actually highly comparable. 
uh, with some sensitivity analysis, so only excluding uh, or focusing on those that were cognitively impaired, so excluding SEDs and, and controls, same results. So it really shows that this is a, uh, a workflow, if you will, that works um, generalizable across different sort of cohorts and and subpopulations. Of course, really a different cohort is, will still be needed because BioFinder is still BioFinder. It is still within one center in, in Sweden. Um, but I think it, it is very compelling that uh, we could replicate these results across the different analysis that we've done.